Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Topics in CTE, Responding to Student Writing When You Are Not the English Teacher, sponsored by the CTE Technical Assistance Center of New York. A few technical points before we begin. Only today's presenter will be audible, and the webinar will be approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes for questions at the end. You may submit a question to be addressed at the end of the webinar by typing it into the questions pane on the control panel. All questions are logged and unanswered questions will be addressed by today's presenter by email. If you become disconnected, please call 518-723-2137. For your information and reference, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the CTE Technical Assistance Center website at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours. If you have questions or suggestions regarding upcoming webinars, please contact the Technical Assistance Center at ctetac at spnet.us. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Doug Silver, and I am the Chief Academic Officer for Writer key, and I'm going to talk, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit about writing and what we need to change, uh, and why do we need to change the way we are teaching writing now? Uh, so to answer that question, we're going to look at some of the practices of what effective writing teachers do, and talk a little bit about the obstacles uh, that need that need to be overcome. And lastly, I'm going to demonstrate some tools that are available for to assist teachers and help student writers across the curriculum. Uh, particularly in the, C in the area of CTE. Uh, so I think the first thing we have to answer, though, is why do CTE teachers uh, assign writing? And I think we're past the question of why should they? Uh, we know that the integration of the academic standards in ELA and math, especially in New York State, because they're directly tied uh, to the teacher evaluation system, but more importantly, it's about integrating and uh, the academic experience for kids across the curriculum so that the close relationships they have with all of their teachers can help them in all of the key areas that they need in order to be uh, college and career ready. So, you know, that's really the emphasis beyond convergence and the CTE Technical Assistance Center of New York has done an excellent job of communicating what that means. I'm going to leave it to them and their resources <clears throat> excuse me, to pick up from there. Uh, instead, really, I'm going to go back to the question, why do CTE teachers assign writing? And for a lot of them, it's they're asking students to demonstrate their understanding of content, which is a, an important goal and important for students to be able to communicate their understanding in writing. Uh, they also assign writing uh, because there's the real world applications, such as communication skills to clients, communication skills to customers, and of course, also to coworkers. And, and then here, here comes the bigger question, which is, do CT teachers assign writing to help kids learn how to write? And that's really the underpinning question of the next 10 minutes of this webinar, is really to try to talk to that question of, you know, do CT teachers assign writing because they want to help kids learn how to write? Um, that's really, kind of the, <clears throat> an underpinning question we have to get after. So, you know, one thing you, we do want to answer, of course, first is, you know, do, is, is there really a problem? You know, the English teachers, the social studies teachers, a lot of teachers have been teaching them writing all the way through their career. Um, but as these statistics show, the job is not getting done, and it's not getting done to uh, the college level satisfaction, where kids are required to take an incredible number of remedial classes at an incredible cost. Uh, 27, excuse me, 77 percent of 8th and 12th grade students in the United States can't write proficiently. And business leaders say that 26.2 percent of college graduates, these are the people who got out of college, are deficient in writing. So clearly, the problem is not really being addressed, and things are not improving in this country and writing is a real problem. So this is what teachers have been doing. They assign lots of writing, particularly near the end of semesters, the end of quarters. They get these huge stacks of paper, and 
they don't know what to do. It's just so much work to, to give students feedback and they wonder what the benefit of it is. You know, when students, you know, get their papers back, are they reading the end comment, looking at the grade and the paper disappearing into the backpack? It sort of makes you wonder why the teachers are spending so much time writing comments in the margin, crossing things out and making students uh, read all of that as, as if that's the instruction. So that's what, a little bit of what we're going to challenge today. Uh, I often joke that this is, this is my wife 40 years from now, um, you know, with, with her desk and she's still, she's been retired for 10 years at this point and she's still working through the pile. My wife's a high school teacher and, and I was a high school teacher for, for 10 years. I recognize the pile um, and something has to give and something definitely has to change. So let's just see if this stuff, you know, sounds familiar to you. Uh, this was a research study that was done in 2012, uh, essentially asking the question, does feedback help? Uh, you know, you look at what the students are saying, and I think we can, we can recognize that. And then when you, you view what the teachers are saying, I think that from what, what the time I've spent with teachers, this sounds, you know, pretty comprehensive, and particularly uh, we're going to address the, the two last ones on the teacher side, which is they don't know what to focus on in my feedback and comments. And number two is, you know, they don't know how to get students to understand the criteria. Uh, and, that's, and that gets to the whole question of, you know, why we're assigning writing. If the purpose of assigning writing is just to produce a grade, then our purpose is much different. So here are some solutions that are out there that we don't think work very well. Um, one is there are, there are many applications out there that are not consistent with what good teachers of writing do. Uh, E-graders, where, where you put the writing into a machine and it spits back some type of score and that is the way we evaluate student writing, is, is not a feedback model. And, and kids are not going to get better at writing in that model. So if the question at the beginning of, this, of the webinar was, you know, do CTE teachers help students learn how to write, the e-grader is not going to help them. Um, so if there are tools that don't understand the model of formative writing, that is that we improve over time through the act of revision, then we're really not going to produce better writers. Uh, you know, one, one tool that people seems more common that they're using are review tools such as Microsoft Word or Google Docs where they type in comments in the right-hand margin. But the problem is, and you'll see this uh, as we move on the webinar, is do those tools really help teachers and students do evidence analysis? Are they really helping them understand what students need instruction, additional instruction in? Or are they just a digital tool to basically do what we used to do with a red pen in the margin? Uh, there are highlighting tools out there that work the similar way. And even Google Docs, there are um, embeds that you can use to do voice comments. But again, what does it all add up to? And that's really where, where, where we want to start this conversation. So when we look at the model of sort of what we're doing, we realize we really just are not trying to be more efficient. We really need to turn the car the other way. And I like this picture because it tells the story that, you know, if, if we changed the way we did things, we would substantively change the way we saw the world and we saw parking. I mean, this, this is just a great picture to, to illustrate that idea. So here's what we've noticed that expert teachers do, uh, particularly the ones that provide differentiated feedback. And <clears throat> we think this is important because when we talk about ELL, special education students, and even at-risk students, this model needs to be as tight as it can be uh, because they're the ones who tend to slip through the cracks um, to, for the most, to, you know, with the highest degree of frequency. So let, let's start here on, you know, providing a formative writing assignment. So typically, um, we've noticed that teachers who give their writing assignments and they view them as formative. That is, that the teachers are going to go back and have students revise their writing. So they need a strategy for effectively managing the large amounts of student work. 
They recognize that they want to read and provide meaningful feedback to each student, and that's individually. Somehow they efficiently get the feedback back to students because we know when the students, you know, if there's a long period of time between the time they hand in an assignment and then let's say two or three weeks go by before they get the feedback, they really don't get a chance to learn from that. The instruction feels old, it feels long ago, and students don't feel like it's timely. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, strategies to become more efficient. And lastly, they do see themselves as a coach, and they're coaching students on how to improve their writing. And, you know, standing side by side with a student is much different than assigning, collecting, and grading writing. And this is the, this is the magic that, that we've seen the great teachers do, is that they close the gap between the feedback they're give, you know, the students are given and the feedback the students actually use. Because one thing that we notice that students say is, you know, I get all these comments back on my, on my paper. I don't even know what they all mean. I can't even read the writing. You know, there's stuff that we didn't even learn about that she's commenting on, and this isn't, being, this isn't helping me. So to the degree that we can close this gap, the gap between the feedback that's given and the feedback that's used, we have a real chance to make a difference with kids. So, you know, when, when the expert teachers that we've seen, expert writing teachers uh, we've seen get a stack of papers, here's, and they pull that first paper off, here seems to be the questions that they ask. They say, you know, what will substantively help the writer? They don't focus on the writing. They think about the student who wrote the paper and how can I help this child? The next thing that they oftentimes ask themselves is what feedback will I give that's instructional? In other words, that if I'm going to spend this time doing it, I want to instruct. My job is not to correct student writing. I am not an editor. I am a teacher. And that is my goal is to help kids be better editors and writers. So what feedback will I give that's instructional? The third thing that's pretty key here is they look at the work that they have done across their class and they say, okay, so I spent all this time giving feedback. What will I, what will I use to inform my instruction going forward? And how will I know what to teach? And then I'll find research that helps me teach it as effectively as possible. And that's what we've seen expert teachers ask themselves. So the implication here isn't that every teacher is going to be an expert teacher. But if we use the same tools as the experts, we have a much better chance of simulating and emulating that experience for our students. And here's, I think, the psychology of what we've noticed, is that they respond to the writers. And I'm, I know I'm repeating myself a little bit, but it's that critical. They understand that, you know, when we read student writing, we are subjective, and we are giving them our opinions. And that's important to understand, because this relationship is the heart of improving the quality of student writing. And from that relationship, we, I think we have to believe that everyone has the capacity to write. The writing can be taught, and teachers can help students become better writers. And if we believe that, if we actually believe that, then we can make a difference. So John Hattie's famous for uh, his research and his meta-studies on what works in schools. Uh, and his series on visible teaching and visible learning uh, is, is a really complex and, and detailed study of you know, whole bunches of, of research studies, and he does this meta-analysis, and he talks about what works and what doesn't, actually what does work and what actually doesn't work in schools. Um, and when he talks about his purposes beyond, you know, his model of feedback, he starts going into this complex diagram, this complex diagram of students and teachers and, you know, reducing the discrepancy between what they understand and what they want them to learn. Uh, I'm leaving this up on the screen as I talk so that you can kind of read through it as I narrate it. But the key here is, you know, that they're providing the appropriate challenge and the specific, and they set specific goals for each student 
that actually students can reach towards. And they reach them in these ways. They ask themselves, the student can ask themselves, where am I going? And that's what he calls feeding up. How am I going? That's the feedback I'm getting. And where to next? That's what he describes as the feed forward. And then I think this is the part where John Hattie gets very complex and maybe a little too in the weeds for all of us. Um, but he essentially asks ourselves, you know, to, to look at each of these questions, such as where am I going, and work through each of the four questions along the bottom. Uh, I will make this available to Gretchen to post along with this webinar so that you can look at this at a future time. Because this is really a critical model of feedback that, that uh, does articulate sort of the broad view, the across the curriculum view of why we are teaching writing. But essentially, I, I kind of summed up his research and a bunch of the other ones into four traits of effective writing teachers. So here's, here's what we're noticing. One, they have clear and focused expectations. Two, they provide models of expected performance. Three, they differentiate instruction. That is, they don't have a single set of comments or a single set of analysis that they put on every student's paper. Um, it's why the holistic rubric as an answer to kids who need help in writing isn't a solution. One rubric for all kids uh, doesn't work. And when we use a rubric at the end as a sole means for giving them instructional feedback, we're not really recognizing that each kid needs something different. And lastly, uh, we recognize that the feedback is formative and it's instructional, not correctional. So I think this is one of my favorite Billy Collins quotes in the poet. You know, he talks about revision of writing and asking students to revise their writing. You know, it isn't the cleanup after the party. It is the party. And that's really sort of where we believe that writing instruction is going to go if we really want to make a difference. So I'm going to introduce you to writerkey.com now, which is a tool teachers are using to accomplish these goals. And built into this tool are the, the system by the, which these traits can be recognized. So I'm going to explain, you know, just using this tool to demonstrate those four qualities of, of effective instruction. So I'm going to go over here and, and just uh, log in. Just a moment. So what you're seeing here is one teacher's uh, class, you know, class load and, and all their assignments. And it happens to be an English teacher because this is what it's loaded up with. But this could be any teacher, and certainly any teacher across the curriculum. Uh, when they arrive here, they can see the status of assignments. They can see whose papers they've graded, which ones have they've yet to give feedback to, and the kids who, aren't, who haven't yet handed in their assignments. And this is important because, you know, a lot of times when we collect writing, we have that inbox and kids abandon their writing and they run out the door and that's the end of it. You know, we, the, in this using this particular tool, the teacher is able to see, you know, who's missing an assignment and communicate with them through an email just by selecting them and sending the email, which seems to us to be a much more practical way of doing that. Uh, you know, so here's how... And, when we look at the tool itself, uh, you know, there are all these assignments, and I know it gets a little complex in this one. So why don't, why don't we look at, at a student's paper here. Here are nine that they've already given feedback to. Uh, for each paper, this teacher had you know, uh, reflections, questions that they built that students answer when they turn in the writing. The writing they've given feedback on. They can see the end comments here. Uh, but we're going to just dive into a student paper and see what it looks like. So here's the paper that's graded. Uh, I'm going to explain what all the coloring is on it. Uh, so essentially what a student did was log into the website. Uh, they uploaded the paper, and now the teacher is giving them feedback uh, to the paper they uploaded to that assignment. So they can see the color, and the color aligns to the feedback areas that are up here. And these are really the areas this teacher's decided to give instructional feedback on. So let's see what that means. So here's kind of an area of the paper that they haven't given feedback on. So 
they're looking sort of at one of these qualities is interpretation analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and select some text. And to give feedback using this tool, all the teacher needs to do is just click on the, the area that is aligned with, what they, with, with the text they highlighted. There are different levels. So they just select the level, save, and exit. So I'll model that again for you. They select the text. They choose the level. They can add additional comments, such as, and save and exit. And then when the student or the teacher rolls over it, you'll see that all that information is, is included in the rollover for that. So the teacher's done a bunch of commenting on this paper. In real time, she can see all of these on a differentiated rubric. That is, this rubric was built for this assignment by the teacher with the students in, in class. I'm going to show you that process in just a minute. But the, but the incremental levels happen as I give the feedback. We know that teachers like to select student writing to use as examples. All she needs to do with this tool is add to a skill builder, and you saw it go to number two, right? Here are the sentences she's clipped, and she can use those in her class. But the more important piece is this is the instructional feedback that she's giving the student. When she does this, the coloring for the special education and the ELL students especially, just the coloring helps them recognize Hey, green was my thesis statement. Oh, yep, I see it. I have fluency. That's where I build in the context for the evidence. That's all there. I get that. This is all the interpretation analysis. Oh, I get it. So the coloring also helps me understand it. Of course, everything you see is a line of the Common Core State Standards. So all of the objectives that this teacher is giving her feedback on, she knows that these are aligned to the Common Core State Standards. And then, of course, there's also what we call correctional feedback. So if you see a comma splice, all you need to do is click on comma splice. The teacher doesn't need to define it because the tool is doing it for them. So when the student comes and experiences their paper and they see an apostrophe error, this gives them information on an apostrophe error. Of course, we know that teachers want to say nice job sometimes, so they do that by just clicking on nice job. On using transitions, you can just save that, and you'll notice roll over, and there it is. If they want to comment on the content, they do that just like this, and you'll notice that there is a little comment button right there. You can also leave voice comments. Now I'm working on a Mac, so you're going to see my little flash thing pop up. So I allow it to record my voice. And now I can record a voice comment into the paper for the student as well. And you'll notice that there's the timer going by, and my literally my voice comment that I'm talking right now is being recorded into it. And you could play it back and listen to it, and you'll get a lot of feedback. There's the timer going by, and my literally my voice comment that I'm talking right now. And that's as simple as to leave a voice comment. So if you're interested in leaving, you know, individualized differentiated instruction, and you want to do it with your voice, it's that simple. Of course, teachers use end comments, and these also can have an audio component as well, or you can type them in. So why, what's so different about this than Google Docs or anything like that? Well, students can go to the training center and learn, when we talked about a comma splice, what is one, all of this is already built in for them. So that the feedback comes with the support next to it. Same thing is true with the objectives. So if a teacher doesn't feel 100% confident in giving the kids feedback uh, and support in their own handouts, well, we've got all that stuff built for the teacher. Of course, the Common Core State Standards alignment is all here. And there are examples and support materials for students built right in. But here's the magic. 
We talked about teachers after they get done with a stack of papers making instructional decisions and how do they do that. Well, using this tool, they go to the data center. When they do, they notice, oh, here were the six areas that I was giving feedback on to the kids. I wonder how my kids did on evidence choice. And all of a sudden, I can see which students are at what levels in evidence choice. And I can say, wow, that's where we need to work in more detail. And when I use my data center, I also can see the reflection data. So we mentioned a little bit that students turn in reflection data when they hand in their, their assignment for the first time. So in this one, I can see that students knew the criteria that will be used for giving me feedback. All of a sudden, teachers can actually see this. Did they check their data in the data center before they handed in the writing? And they focused on areas of feedback from previous writing. And we've obviously coded the student names for privacy. But all of a sudden, you can, say, you can see that students are giving the teacher feedback about what they are and are not understanding. And when I want to make instructional decisions based on you know, what my students are learning, I can look at what marks, oh, punctuation errors and comma splices. I don't need to teach everything. I just need to teach the things my, I'm noticing in my students' writing. So how does this all get built? Because one of the things we noticed, and one of the first things and the most important things, were teachers give clear expectations for what they want. So let's build an assignment together and take a look at what that looks like. So I'm going to start by adding an assignment. And this is pretty obvious. I mean, this is just giving, you know, we're going to build a sample assignment. We're going to, in my American literature class. Now, the informative explanatories of the ELA standards is probably the most appropriate most of the time for the assignments typical to give in CTE classes. However, argument analysis is certainly a common one as well. And if you want to know more about the rhetorical genres and the Common Core State Standards, in this set of tools, they have all of that built uh, for you. So you just need to click the little keys that are next to the item. If you're going to collect multiple drafts, we know that the first draft might be, our expectations for the first draft might be different than the final version. And then what you're going to grade with. So if you grade with number grades or letter grades, it's easy to do that. As well, for the other you know, other content area teachers may wish to use the SAT rubric or the ACT rubric. Those are available as well. You can decide when to make the assignment available to kids. Uh, this is th what that means is essentially just like the, the current days in, in our classes when we hand out the assignment sheet for the, for the essay or for the analysis or for the explanation or for the guide that we want students to build or whatever the type of writing assignment it is they're doing. Uh, this is when they is accessible to them on WriterKey. There are supports built in, and there is a way to uh, require students to give you feedback prior to being able to see their grade. So for instance, they'll be able to see all the feedback you give them, but they won't be able to see their grade, and then they have to respond to you prior to that, prior to seeing their grade. So you have to enter in a simple description. You assign a due date to the assignment. This is pretty simple stuff, right? We do this already. And then we really get to the heart of the tool, which is you cannot give students more than feedback in more than six areas. Why do we say that? Simply because of what we, we know this, the studies on cognitive overload. And if you're looking for more information about those, I suggest going to writerkey.com and clicking on the research down here. Uh, for more information on cognitive overload. But essentially, when we just write anything we want all over the side of kids' papers, well, the experience of that is we overload them with information. And what we really need to do is target our feedback to be what we are teaching. So if these are the areas we're teaching, then these are the areas we should be giving them feedback on. And six, is plenty. Now, that's all it takes to create an assignment. And I could be saved and done and, and on my way. But I'm going to show you a few other things here, just because 
you know, for our more advanced users, this is what, what they like the most, and I don't want to leave it out. But, you know, you can see the rubrics that you're going to, you know, for each one that you're selecting. You can see the Common Core State Standards for each of these as well. So we'll hit Save and Next. Now I mentioned students turn in reflections. You can edit these in advance and have students respond to a prompt of your own. You can load up model texts. So we know that the most effective writing teachers give students models. So what might a model essay? You just select it from wherever you select assignments from. I'm browsing my hard drive. There's the model essay. I add the resource. And now kids will have this model essay to look at when they're building theirs. So if there's a sample assignment sheet or a sample, let's say we're, we're doing a visitor's guide, that a model of it can be displayed right here. We can sh collaborate with other teachers. So if we do want to collaborate with a content area teacher, a special education teacher, an ELL teacher, whomever, we don't have to split the pile anymore. They can also participate in giving kids feedback using the tools here. And lastly, if we're talking about correctional feedback, and we've noticed that this was a pattern I covered earlier in, this, in the year, and I don't want to do any more instruction in it, but I want kids to notice it, I can put it up in my tray for this assignment. And I can pull other ones out that I don't want to use, just as simply as dragging and dropping them to the tray or the trash can. And now I can also create my own if that's what I want to do. And then now that I've done this, this assignment now appears on the desk. I know that obviously that all 24 kids in our class have not used it, but that's, that's how it, simple it is to add an assignment. There are learning activities, which have all sorts of neat tools that you can use. There's conferences. So if you, have, uh, if you conference with a student about their writing or about their assignment, you can make a record of it so that you, know, you, you hold a conference with a kid you know, you say, okay, my American Lit class, I'm going to meet with, uh, you know, Sam here, and here's the, you know, the subject. I can even align what we're doing to whatever standards I like. And then when I take notes, when I meet with the student about that assignment, I might have them record in their comments about what they learned during our conference and then save the notes so that all that time I spent working with kids actually amounts to something. That all of their assignments, all of their feedback, and all of the information that I've given them is in one place. And so when I look at a, you know, a particular student, I can see the communication, I can see the conferences, the emails I've sent them, all in one place. So it's the kind of one stop solution that builds all of the best practices of what we see with effective writing teachers. Now, I know what I've been demonstrating for you is, is very complex and very detailed. Um, and I would like to open this up for, you know, with plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to do that now. So Gretchen, if you have any questions that are coming in, feel free to interrupt me. Um, as I'll, I'll just go through sort of some of the additional features of this while questions are coming in. All right. So what were the learning activities again? Um, there are several types of learning activities. Imagine that you had students going through their own paper and giving feedback on it. That's this one, where students analyze their own paper. And you create the description of, the, of what you want them to do. You pick the objectives that they're going to uh, target with their assignment, any reflections you want them to do, and they use the tool to assign the to analyze the writing. We also have ones where you can do an analysis of writing that you create. So here's one where a teacher created it using a poem, but it could be any piece of writing, and the students are required to do annotations, and then. The teacher built in a response, and students respond to that prompt down below. We also know that students and teachers want to use the tool together. 
So let's take a, a look at one. So here's one where a student scored a paper and gave it feedback, and then the teacher did. And the student can now see how they did alongside what the teacher did. And if you look at the rubric view, you can see, oh, wow, the student gave it this kind of feedback. But the teacher said it was down here. Maybe this is an area of instruction we need to work together on. So there are learning activities that reinforce your goals as a teacher in the areas of writing. Now, for CTE teachers who you know, might give a, a shorter assignment or one where they don't want a lot of complex writing, but they want to collect uh, analysis and simple and give quick, efficient feedback, this, this way of doing it means this teacher has access to these papers anytime. Anywhere she, where she has Wi-Fi, she can give feedback to these students. So it's, it's a wonderful tool also for not losing student writing, but also not having to carry it around with you all over the place as well. Uh, we know that that, that becomes a burden. Uh, Teachers who have started using this tool have said that uh, you know, what, they, what they notice the most is at the beginning of using it, they become much more effective, and then they become much more efficient. So oh, what a teacher is asking about the cost of this. There is a pilot program uh, associated with this tool. So you could log on to, if we go to the home page here, let me just I'll log on to this. Uh, there is an area down here that tells you how to buy it. There is a pilot program as well. Uh, you can talk with the CTE TAC Center, let them know you're interested, and you know, we can also figure things out. There are interactive demos and models for you as well. This webinar will be posted for the, for the CTE site, but there's also a presentation that I did at Ed Lab at Teachers College Columbia University on this uh, and these tools and these ideas, which you can reference down here. If your school has Schoology, uh, it is an app within Schoology as well. So that's how you you might come come to it. Gretchen, are we we have other questions out there? We do. We have a couple questions for you. Um, the first one's from an assistant principal. They asked, um, they said, I am an assistant principal assigned to automotive technology and health industry teachers. How can I assist them in giving students writing assignments? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, the challenge is, is you know, what, what do they want students to know? And how are they going to ask students to demonstrate that knowledge in real world ways? So, particularly in the automotive and, you know, healthcare uh, areas, I am not an expert, um, but I would defer to, to the people in those areas and say, is writing a part of what they do in those jobs? Um, do they have to read? Or do they have to write uh, to demonstrate they understand that they can communicate with customers and clients? Uh, and so I would look to what are the real world activities that those professions are engaged in and ask them. You know, what are the writing assignments or what, are the, what, are, what is the writing that people in those career clusters do? And that's where I would start with that. Okay, and the next question and the last question, unless someone types one in shortly, is what do students use to submit writing, Google Docs, Word, etc.? Oh, on this, on this tool, you can use anything that creates a document. So you can use uh, Microsoft Word, you can use Pages if you save it as a doc, you can use Google Doc if you save it as a doc. That doesn't matter. The only thing is it can't be a PDF. Okay, we have one more question. It's somewhat yeah. of a long one, so bear with me. Um, Got it. It says, this seems to be a very strong tool. However, it doesn't answer the question as to why we would want a family and consumer science teacher teaching writing. I haven't been trained on teaching writing, and for example, I don't know what a comma splice is, and wouldn't recognize one existed in students' writing either. I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't want an ELA teacher teaching Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I do not think you want me to teach ELA skills. All right, and that's you know that's really um, 
something that the, TA, the CT TAC Center has been focused on, on doing a better job of than I will do in this presentation, which is why should CTE teachers be engaged in teaching the academics of writing, of reading, of speaking and listening, and math skills? Um, why, are those, why do we see that those skills cut across content areas? And why do they kids need it more than one period a day and for more teachers than one? Uh, I know that they've done it, uh, they have a lot of resources in this area, and I refer you to them. I would, from my, from my own personal standpoint, I would say this. Uh, the reason that a family and consumer science teacher wants to teach writing is because my guess is, is that in the careers that are associated with family and consumer science, there are the necessary opportunities for kids to write specifically to that uh, in real world ways for those skills. And who better than somebody who's very familiar with those content areas to have the kids write in those places. Now, whether they're giving them correctional feedback about comma splices, I'd say that's not as important. But about giving them feedback about organization and development, about giving them feedback about their choice of evidence, I think those are things that cut across content areas. And so when I look at you know, informative explanatory and I look at, well, I'll just pull it up so we can all look at it together, uh, like in grades 9, 10, informative explanatory writing, and I talk about the body of what I want students to explain their knowledge, the development of topic, the fluency, the integration of the research, I think those things probably do cut across all content areas. So that's my best answer, but I think this the CTE TAC Center can give a much more detailed one in their resources that you'll find on their website. Great, we have no more questions at this time. Sad, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar presented by Doug Silver. As a reminder, this webinar will be available for viewing at nyctecenter.org within 72 hours.